Uh, I'm doing great. So I've had lots of family, uh, lots of friends, um, huge outpouring of huge outpouring of, of support from from strangers. Um, tons of people have contacted and just said, you know, I'm glad you're safe. You know, glad to you know know that everything worked out. So those moments that you were there. And did you have any idea of what was going on? Could you see outside at all? And did he make you sit still? What what was happening? I did not know a lot of what was going on other than, um, you know, mm -hmm. what was being transmitted through the negotiator, you know, because I could hear them talking on the phone. I was right sitting across from him, so I could hear, you know, pretty much the gist of the conversation. Um, he, the first thing he had made me do was close the blinds when I went into the office. So we, you know, he didn't want them to be able to see in there, obviously. <laughs> and um, he had, you know, made me sit in the chair and he had told me to sit there and he wanted me to sit there because the way the office is situated, when you first go in the door, that's, you know, who you would see first. And he wanted me to be the first person they see. So. He, the, and that's, you know, he made me sit there, but, you know, he was very nice, very courteous, you know. <laughs> nice and courteous. And I know yesterday, because we were texting you, and you were saying that you felt safe. I mean, were you just saying that, or did you really feel that way, that you were okay, and that you felt yeah, safe? Yeah, everyone was asking me, are you okay, are you safe? And, you know, everyone that was texting me that, I was like, yes, I'm fine, I'm okay. So. What's that moment when you're, when you're, I mean, you can run from this guy, you can try to fight this guy. What was the process that you thought? Well, I, it never crossed my mind to try to run or <laughs> to fight him. He was a, I, you know, I'm sure you guys have seen his, his mugshot and, you know, he was a 6'4 gentleman. He was very, you know, he was very tall and I'm pretty small. So <laughs> I was not going to try to run. Um, I, my, my tactic and survival instinct just kicked in. I was like, if I can just get him to talking and get him to like me as much as possible, hopefully that will work out. So. What sort of demands was he making and what was he saying to you? Um, he was making demands as far as you know, negotiating his arrest and everything. Um, I can't really go into the details of what you know he was asking or anything like that. But he was he was not you know making any extravagant you know demands or anything like that. It was basically you know just what he wanted when he was in jail and that sort of thing. Did he so. ever say why he was doing what he was doing? All he ever said that he kept repeating was that he just wanted to go to jail. But. Um, you know, he wanted solitary confinement. He just wanted to be in jail. So, do you, do you know? I know that when we got your text messages, it said we, he wants to talk to the DA. Did the DA come up stairs and talk? He to said, him? yeah. He said, you know, that he wanted the DA. He told that to the negotiator. He told me he's like, tell them I want the DA. You know, um, that was part of. He was wanting the DA just for purposes of being able to negotiate. You know, his arrest terms. Can we go back to when it all began, what you were doing, and then all of a sudden what you heard and saw? Um, it all began, everyone was at lunch at the time, so there was only me and one other person in our office at that time. Um, I heard someone come into our lobby, and since, you know, our receptionist and everything was gone, um, I went in there to see who it was, because I figured it was probably just one of our clients. By the time I got there, whoever had come in and said hello had walked back out. So I looked at my coworker, and we're like, oh, well, that's strange that they just came in, said hello, and walked out. And we were starting to walk back towards our offices, and that's when another gentleman burst into our office and said, there's a man with a gun, lock the doors. You know, and at first you're so dumbfounded, like you're just like shocked, you know, that th this is happening. And it takes you a minute to even believe it. And so we, you know, of course, we, you know, began to move towards to lock the doors, and at that point, he came uh, to the door. He had a gentleman with uh, with him in front of him with a gun pointed to his neck, and he tapped on the glass. You know, was our, our office doors are, are pure glass, and he tapped on the glass and saying, "You know, open the door." And at that, we didn't. Do, we fled to our offices and we're shutting doors and everything. And that's when you know he just came in by force. And uh, it, when I heard the gunshots. I was afraid, I didn't know what had happened to that gentleman that he had. So I was hiding under my desk, I hit the floor. He walks in, I have no idea what happened to the gentleman he had, I'm thinking the worst. And um, so, and at that point I was hoping he hadn't seen me, but he had, <laughs> and so he, that he told me to stand up. And you know, he's like, come with me, I'm not gonna hurt you, you know. You know, and he was, you know, he's like, he, he's like, ma'am, please stand up. You know, it was very, <laughs> and of course I was shaking. I was, you know, saying, please, please don't hurt me. I, you know, I have two children. And he's like, I'm not going to hurt you. 
you know, I, you know, just come with me. We're gonna, you know, I, I just want to negotiate. Do you think that because you seem to stay calm throughout this terrifying ordeal, that helped to bring this to a peaceful resolution? You know, he was he was not a nervous person. He was extremely calm uh, uh, throughout the whole ordeal. Um, when he first came in there, I was pretty hysterical. I was, you know, upset and crying at the beginning, you know, when he, you know, shot through the door and walks in. Um, but, you know, he actually calmed me down. He's, and he assured me, I'm not going to hurt you. Just sit here. He was, you know, very nice. And at that point, I started calming down and, you know, I kind of went into survival mode at that point. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to start talking to him. And that's what I did. Did you believe him when he said, I'm not going to hurt you? I wanted to believe it. <laughs> um, I, I, my gut instinct told me that he was not going to hurt me. Um, it took, it did take me a little bit to believe that, and it was in the back of my mind since I had not known what had happened to the gentleman, you know, that I had seen him with. Uh, he told me, oh, he ran away, but I don't know. You know, I'm sitting there. Is he just telling me that? You know, I didn't know. So, as a wife and a mother. What kind of thoughts were going through your head about the people you care for dearly, dearly yeah. and being away from them with a gunman right next to you keeping you hostage? What was that like? What were you thinking and how did you get through it? When it initially happened and I heard the gunshots, like, I thought this is it. You know, that's, I was definitely the moment that I'm like, he's serious. He just used the gun, you know. You know this, and I was frantically, yeah, you know, calling. At that point, I was actually on the phone with my father, and you know, frantically telling him to call the police. And he couldn't even hear me because the gunshots were going off in the background. So um, it was, yeah, you know, I was thinking the worst when he first came in there. Um, afterwards, once you know, I started talking to him and I calmed down, and you know, I sat in there with him for my goodness, you know, four, little, over four hours and talked with him. It, I, I certainly got to a point where I knew he, I was 95% sure he was not going to hurt me. He was extremely courteous. He even apologized, you know, for the situation and said, I just want to negotiate. You know, I'm sorry to put you through this. And so, I mean, at that point, I was not scared anymore. I know that at some point we, we heard that you were helping write and draft some sort of letter to, for his release. Was, was that something that you were doing? Did you think it would have any bearing at all? Or is, was it just something that, to help get this yeah. moving? I actually did not, uh, that, I know that's being reported, yeah. but actually I didn't write anything. What I was doing it was help because he was you know, telling me what he wanted. And <clears throat> it, when he had first burst in there, I had asked him, because he told me I could use my phone. And he, uh, you know, I asked him, can I please call my boss? My boss is an attorney. And um, so I called my boss, and we actually put him on speakerphone, and he asked the gentleman, you know, what can I do for you? Can you please let her go? Um, and he's like, no, I just need to negotiate terms and everything. And once he realized that my boss was an attorney, he was like, oh, great, you can proofread, you know, my negotiation. And so um, at that point, um, when the police negotiator came in, I was texting the demands. My attorney had promised to, or the attorney I worked for had, you know, said he would proofread it. You know, the negotiators and police were all working out everything. It was, it was all of us together working, you know, trying to just make him happy and get everything resolved. So, how did it all come to an end? Um, well, basically, we came up with an agreement that he was he was happy with. So, um, and then SWAT members moved in. What were those moments like? Uh, the SWAT team actually did not move in okay. once he um, once he had an agreement that he was happy with. Um, you know, like I said, they proofread it and everything. They gave it to him, and um, he said okay, and he signed it and he motioned for me. You know, you can go. And he said, you know, um, Jennifer's coming out, and they said okay, just come out with your hands up. And I he let me go. I went down the hallway. They were you know at the end of the hallway, and they escorted me out of the building. Wow. So. It, that moment when you walk out there and you see those guys at the end of the hall, what are you thinking? I, you know, I knew that they were there because they were yelling back and forth during the entire time. I knew there was people all in the hallway. Um, I didn't realize how many there were there because you walk out and it's, I, I didn't even realize so many people could cram into that hallway. Um, so it was definitely a deer in the headlights moment, but I, you know, I just moved towards the first person I saw and they, you know, got me out of there. 
And, and what did they do? They just took you, ch checked you out? Were you able to reunite with family members downstairs? They took me straight down. They had medics there that, you know, were, you know, making sure that, you know, there was no injuries, that I was okay. I mean, that was definitely their first concern. I mean, they were great. The, you know, the police, the medics, everyone was, you know, so professional. And <clears throat> my health was definitely their first concern. And once they knew I was okay, I spoke with the police and everything, and then I was able to reunite with family. Who did you see first in your family, and, and what did you guys talk about? Uh, it was actually my whole family was there in a group, and I saw them when I first came out, but they were like, oh, you have to talk to the police first, and I think that was, it was hard because they were all there. We saw each other, so we at least knew everything was okay, but um, it was, it, it didn't feel completely over until I was able to just run into their arms, and it was like a huge group hug, so. <laughs> I'm so struck by how calm you are even today. Has it been difficult emotionally since this all went down in the last 24 hours? Or have you remained this calm throughout this time? I think it's hard. You know, it's one of those things that it takes you so much to, to absorb mm -hmm. what just happened. Um, it took a long time for me to calm down. You know, there's def definitely an adrenaline rush there. And um, I feel like it didn't affect me, but I, at the same time, like, you know, I didn't hardly get any sleep, you know, that sort of thing. So it's definitely affected me more, I think, than I realize. Can you ever imagine anything like this? No, <laughs> no. It was just a regular Monday morning, you know, it was lunchtime, regular day, and then everything changed. When are you going back to work? Um, at this point, they're saying, you know, when I'm, whenever I'm ready. So they're, I mean, it's, they're being great. So. Just taking your time. Mm -hmm. And you said you have two kids. Yes. So were your kids there whenever you were released and you had the big family moment? No, actually they were not um, because you know, they had been in school. Okay. There was a family member that was at the house with them. They were kind of trying to shield them yeah. and everything because they are younger. So, um, yeah, they, they were not there at the time. We didn't, I mean, it was a circus, I'm sure, as you saw on the, the television. I mean, there was police everywhere. Media was everywhere. It's not something I wanted to bring them in the middle of. Have you had a talk with them just yet about what happened? Yeah, yeah. I knew that, you know, once I realized how big, you know, it had become, you know, I definitely realized I was going to have to talk to them because, you know, their friends and stuff like that were going to come up to them. So I, I did talk to them, and they understand, you know, as much as they need to know about the situation and everything. I was just so surprised that you were able to text people. I couldn't believe he, yeah. that he, how did all of that come about? Yeah, he was, like I said, when um, I went into the room, um, my because I had been on the phone when he had burst through the door, and I, you know, had frantically called family and stuff, you know, saying, please call 911, there's a gunman, you know, he's shooting through the door. Um, so, my, of course, my phone was just going off like crazy, you know, and he heard it, and he was like, you can answer that. He's like, you can call, text, whatever you feel, whatever makes you more comfortable, whatever you feel you need to do, you know, you are more than welcome to do it. And he's like, you know, he's like, I want you to be comfortable. Wow. Did, so. did you have a television in, in there or radios or anything that you, you couldn't tell anything that was going no. on? No, no. All we knew either. was did, the negotiator. Were you able to talk to the other hostages? Well, you guys were there, or, were you, or was the only person you could talk to you was? It was just him. Um, the uh, the hostages that were actually at the time that that happened, I thought there was only one gentleman in the office adjacent to me. When later to come to find out, there were two. Mm -hmm. I knew that there had been a gentleman that had run in, like I had said previously, and said there's a gunman, but I had no idea where he had went. We all scattered when you know when that happened. So I was thinking it was just my coworker in that office when it was actually both of those gentlemen were in that was he office. Yelling at them? How did they? I mean, how did they know to stay there? Were they? Well, he had actually told them to get out of there, and you know, and had threatened them and everything, and they they wouldn't. You know, of course, they weren't going to unlock the door. So um, he he pretty much just gave up on them, and we moved into the office beside it, and he had me sit down. So, so. it was pretty much you and him. In it the was me and him. Most yeah. Of the time. They were not talking to him. <clears throat> you know, the people that were in the other office, they had barricaded themselves inside. So it was it was me and him. We had heard that he was telling those guys if they tried to get away that he was going to kill you. Is that true? That I'm that I believe has been mis, okay. you know, 
misrepresented. Um, he basically, ha he did threaten, you know, saying, you know, open up the door and everything like that. But at that point, once he realized they were not going to open the door, you know, we moved into the next office. And, you know, there was no more communication with them because, you know, they weren't talking to him. And he even, you know, he said, you know, I could get there, but it's just not worth it. What would you say to him today if you, if you get, had a chance to talk to him? Um, I actually bear no ill will towards him. Um, talking with him for the first hour and a half while we were waiting on a police negotiator, it was just me and him. There was no police, you know, quite there yet. And so, um, oh, of course they were there, but the, you know, they hadn't moved in and, you know, tried to talk to him yet. And so through talking with him, I mean, he was completely calm. You know, he was very courteous, like I've said. And, um, he, I, I bear no ill will towards him, and he explained, you know, his, you know, that he was, you know, a veteran. He was in, you know, Iraq and Afghanistan is what I was told from him. Um, he said that he had been able to find work, you know, that would pay him above minimum wage. And so I, and I asked him, I was like, is that why you're doing this? And he said, no, that has nothing to do with it. And then that was kind of the, I wasn't going to push it. But, you know, it was one of those things that he, he never gave a clear motive. But, you know, we talked books and politics, whatever kept him talking, you know, we just talked. And so I, you know, I didn't feel that he was going to hurt me. I bear him no ill will. So did he reveal anything else about himself personally, where he grew up, if he has a family, any sort of those details? He, he did not really reveal that so much to me. Um, they went over that, you know, the police asked him that stuff. Um, you know, he, he didn't go into detail. He didn't really want to talk to them that much. All he would say is that, you know, he was from California. He's not from Oklahoma. Um, he just randomly chose that building, so. Well, we are so thankful that you are safe and sound back with your family and doing okay. Yeah, sure. definitely. Yeah. I, I, I believe it could have been so much worse. Did he tell so. you why he wanted to be arrested? He did not, and um, there was actually some confusion. I mean, confusion by the police, by the, you know, us as hostages. You know, we couldn't understand why. Um, he just said he wanted to go to jail. He, he felt that he had no more value in society and that he just wanted to go to jail and be in solitary confinement for the rest of his life. So. And you said he could not find a job above minimum wage, is that right? That's what he That's said, what he yeah. Okay. And he said that to, you know, to the police as well. And it was, it was kind of, you know, in passing at that moment. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's one of those things that you didn't want to push because if he became agitated, I mean, that was the last thing you wanted, so. And did he keep the gun with him the whole time? I mean, on his hand, up to you, or was he kind of relaxed at times? He was he was relaxed a lot of the time. At, at one point, he even you know asked me, he's like, "May I smoke?" And he smoked a cigarette and was talking to the negotiators. And um, um, he he definitely had the gun with him at all times, but he wasn't you know threatening me with it or it, you know pointing at it. They threw this this phone at the door. Is that is that what happened? Did, it, did they yell at him? Did they? Yeah, they did bring up a phone. Um, there was at first there was yelling back and forth, and he asked for a phone. It took them a very long time to get a phone up there, um, you know, because I believe they were needing you know special sort of because it was definitely a special you know police type phone that they brought up. So um, it took a while before they could get the phone. They were yelling back and forth, but. Are you a little nervous about going when you do decide to go back to work and just walk into those doors again? Well, I actually had to go there today to get all my stuff because I, um, my purse, my keys, my car was all still there, you know, because I couldn't get in there. The police were processing everything, so. But, I mean, I went in today and I talked. I mean, of course, everyone was great and supportive and, um, you know, just want to make sure it's okay and so you know I got my stuff and it was you know I did go back and look where everything had happened and it was it was definitely surreal but it was one of those things I actually kind of I had to see it to you know <laughs> it's like that really happened so well you are a strong woman <laughs> thanks less than 24 hours sharing all this story yeah it's well crazy. I mean uh, the big reason why um, I wanted to talk about it was was mostly because um, I don't believe he was necessarily a bad person. I believe he was more of a broken person. You know, the, I think there was definitely some issues as far as um, what I had picked up, you know, what he had said as far as, you know, be, him being a veteran and everything like that. So I, I felt that that was important to speak out. I didn't want 
you know, you see this on the news all the time. I didn't want people to think that he was something that he wasn't, so.